An economic crisis now turned into a political crisis here in Sri Lanka. Uh, we thought of talking about the legal, the constitutional grounds as we look at ways and means to move forward, uh, a pathway to progress and to find a solution to the current crisis. I've invited to our studios the president of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, President's Council, Mr. Salih Pires. A very warm welcome. Thank you for joining Thank you. us. Thank you. Um, where do we start? Uh, you, you, the Bar Association presented several proposals uh, um, as a way to come out of uh, the crisis and uh, what constitutional changes or amendments or additions we need to bring forth. But prior to that, uh, what have you got to say as a citizen of Sri Lanka about what's going on in the country? Well, I think there is both uh, economic and political instability and one is impacting on the other. And if we do not resolve the political instability, it would contribute to f the f further downturn of the economy. And I think we all know that the economy is in very dire circumstances. And if, the, uh, if nothing is done, or if uh, the, there is a danger of collapse, and uh, the next few months are going to be extremely hard to the people of this country, uh, whatever reforms have been suggested are also going to impact on the people who are already feeling uh, feeling the impact very much. So uh, I, in those circumstances, I think it is imperative that the political instability be resolved early. Um, how do you propose we bring about these changes? Uh, We're talking about a 21st Amendment to the Constitution. And the Bar Association says we need uh, to repeal the provisions of the 20th and introduce the 21st, but it would uh, effectively be a hybrid of the 19th Amendment. Um, so so how do we bring this together? Yes, I think the, uh, the reason, the, the, the among the proposals of the Bar Association, the first proposal is that to repeal the 20th, provisions of the 20th, except for a few provisions such as the increase of the number of judges, but other than that, to repeal the provisions of the 20th, mm -hmm. to bring in, as the 21st Amendment, to bring in the provisions essentially of the 19th Amendment, but we propose an improved version of the 19th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Now, why we, we say this is, if you look at the economic crisis, the uh, one of the main issues of the economic crisis is the failure of independent institutions. The classic example of the failure of an institution is the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is that the independence of the Central Bank was not secure. Traditionally, the head of the Central Bank has been a uh, uh, an independent person. Mm -hmm. The governor of the central bank has generally been an independent person. Mm -hmm. But you found a person who held, immediately prior who held ministerial office was brought in and appointed as the governor. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the When the independence of institutions are compromised, that has an impact on governance. Mm -hmm. So we see that, we, uh, as a first step, we see the, the reenactment of the provisions of the 19th amendment with necessary changes as the way forward to ensure that there are adequate checks and balances on the executive presidency. Uh, your, some of your proposals, uh, since you spoke about the uh, appointment of the governor of the central bank, it says that the monetary board should uh, also be approved by the constitutional council. But doesn't the provisions uh, that the central bank act already provide for uh, a central bank governor to act independently? No, but the, the point is you have to have a person who, is indip who, who has an independent thinking who, uh, who, and also the person who is appointed to that office is very absolutely important. Mm -hmm. So we, we find uh, one of the reasons, one of the reasons for this downturn is that when we, uh, admittedly uh, the, the government, the president was warned that there was a need to go to the IMF mm -hmm. uh, or need to sort out Sri Lanka's debt. Uh, deaths, but that was not done because uh, we found that uh, at various instances the governor of the central bank would come and say, "Well, there is there is a roadmap," but we found that that was a that was a failure. Mm -hmm. So, among the reasons among the reasons for this economic downturn is that there was there is too much of power vested in the executive president, and there are no checks and balances on the executive presidency. Now that is the reason why the 19th Amendment was enacted, and prior to the 19th Amendment, the 17th Amendment was enacted. But we 
for some reason when the, after the after the president after the general elections the government decided to go back uh, to go uh, to repeal the 19th and re enact the 20th in fact at that point at that point the bar association of sri lanka was one of the institutions which challenged the 20th amendment to the constitution because we, we at that time the bar association saw that as uh, wasting too much power on the executive president mm -hmm. so that principle stands today it is reinforced today mm -hmm. uh, by we should not have an all powerful executive president and so as a first step we, we th that is not the only step we are suggesting but as a first step we say with the uh, reenact the 19th amendment but we are bringing call it the 21st amendment we we uh, we propose further changes for instance we suggest that the appointments of secretaries to ministries governors of provinces uh, of diplomats also be done by the president on the advice of the prime minister in consultation with the cabinet of ministers. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about the 19th amendment, Mr. Pires, um, the, the Rajapaksa regime then alleged that the 19th amendment took away the military intelligence arms powers to focus on national security. Um, so don't you have any concerns of the 19th amendment? Uh, yes, you say the 19th should be amended and not uh, be uh, implemented in full, but aren't there concerns um, as we talk about national security. I think that is a fallacy and that I think that is a red herring uh, brought out to try to just strengthen the executive presidency. The I do not think any lapses in security could be uh, attributed to the 19th amendment. If there were lapses in security, especially relating to the Easter Sunday bombing, I, that cannot be attributed to the 19th amendment and checks and balances on the on executive power. Mm -hmm. uh, our economic crisis is a classic example of how an uh, all-powerful executive presidency has not been able to address the key issues of the country. Uh, talking about the 19th too, uh, the 19th was supposed to bring about the abolition of the executive but failed to deliver. We did see uh, the, the tug of war between the executive and the prime minister and government. So how can we in such circumstances have a constitutional, uh, give in sufficient powers to parliament so that uh, the issues we saw during the uh, enactment of the 19th amendment will not arise? Yes, I, I, th I think the idea is that you have a president initially with the with the reenactment of the 19th amendment or the 21st amendment you have the presidency the powers of the president curtailed and the it would be the uh, ministers would be appointed on the advice of the prime minister uh, the it is in uh, the, uh, the the power balance would shift from a all powerful executive to a more pruned down executive presidency mm -hmm. but that is that is only as a we are suggesting that step only as a first step. Right? We want to make that very, very clear. That is not finally what we say ought to be done. For a long time, we have believed in Sri Lanka that uh, an executive president was necessary, especially when we talk about uh, national security, when we refer to the war, um, or when we talk about uh, the ter 13th Amendment and devolution of power. So can Sri Lanka, an island nation as Sri Lanka do away uh, with an executive president? Sri Lanka as an island nation up to 1977-78 we had a prime minister, the executive where the prime minister was the head of the government and it was a, what we call a parliamentary executive and there is, there is no allegation that the executive was not strong at that point. Now, it was the President Jayawadhan who introduced the executive presidency on the basis that he, he gave the example of Singapore mm -hmm. and they said there was strong executive. But Singapore does not have an executive president. Singapore has a, a prime minister and a cabinet of ministers and it is parliament. The, the, the cabinet of ministers is accountable to parliament. So it is, I say it is a myth or it is a fallacy to say that the country needs an executive president presidency in order to develop or to in order to ensure the unification of the country. The classic example is India. Mm -hmm. India has a prime minister and a cabinet of ministers who are responsible and accountable to parliament. India has a constitutional presidency. But India has uh, states. There are states. India is a quasi-federal country. They have states. Uh, but in certain circumstances, the powers the center can take over the uh, administration. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, 
Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, the uh, center enacted uh, certain legislation uh, in respect of Jammu and Kashmir. So to say that you, without the executive presidency, that the country will be divided, or that the country cannot develop is an absolute fallacy. Uh, how about uh, the North and East? If we talk specifically about the North, North and East merger that uh, the North requests has been uh, spoken about, the national question for a long time we've been talking about. The, uh, the 19th Amendment has, would have no impact on the or, or on the 13th Amendment, on the Provincial Council. But without a strong executive? You can have a strong executive with, with the Prime Minister in a prime ministerial form of government, you can have a strong e executive. But the difference is, you would have an executive which is responsible to parliament. Does and not the, not the all-powerful uh, presidency, who, who, which is unaccountable, which is de facto unaccountable to parliament. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so you have almost a semi-monarch, a monarchical system, where the president cannot be touched, where cabinet ministers do not want to offend the president, uh, even if they privately disagree, they do not want to say things, rather to come out in parliament and disagree. So for, it is for that reason that you, you can have a strong executive in a prime ministerial form of government. Mm -hmm. Many, uh, many countries have the prime ministerial form of government. Even in France, where there is an executive presidency, the head of government is a prime minister. Only in Sri Lanka. Uh, of course, the United States is different, but there exists a whole separate set of checks and balances there. But even France, the Sri Lankan presidency is supposed to be built, uh, modeled on France. Mm -hmm. But even in France, the head of government is a prime minister. But in Sri Lanka, the head of state, the head of the executive, head of the government, uh, everything is the president. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the 20th Amendment, the 19th Amendment tried to clip the wings, so to say, of the president, or to curtail the powers of the president to ensure a more balanced executive. Mm -hmm. But the 20th threw that, all that into the uh, dustbin. Uh, when talking about a 21st amendment uh, and uh, referring to devolution of power, uh, if the North and East is merged, we are also talking about uh, that there have been concerns of a united Sri Lanka, whether this will allow for a united Sri Lanka uh, to exist, or whether there will be division, whether communities and the country will be divided. This, this narrative that, has... That, uh, is a, that is a totally false narrative. The 21st Amendment, or if we say the 19th Amendment, would have no impact on the unitary status of Sri Lanka. The, uh, the, this, is a, this is a wrong narrative by people who want to keep this executive presidency and this power, all powerful executive going. And uh, this, is a, this is just to hold, hold that out and to frighten people. Uh, the, the, the unitary state of the country is governed by Article 2 of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. The Provincial Council uh, were enacted under the 13th Amendment. It is very clear that any 19th or the 21st Amendment as uh, the Bar Association proposes is not going to impact on the unitary status of Sri Lanka. What it will do is to ensure that the, the president is accountable. Of course, we have suggested, thereafter we suggest that the executive presidency should be abolished, but we suggest a period of time. We mm -hmm. suggest six months for the legislation to be enacted, and down the line we suggest let it be operative as early as possible, but within 15 months. What will be the uh, the, the uh, powers vested with the provincial councils and local governments? Uh, uh, if you talk about the 21st Amendment, it, 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 it will... It would remain the same as mm -hmm. it was since the uh, 13th Amendment. Would, would it be stronger with the, with an executive uh, whose powers are clipped? Uh, you mean uh, the, the, the local governments, will they be powerful? Uh, Lo I, I think there is... There is uh, the, we must understand this. When you talk of the executive, when you talk of curtailing the powers of the executive president, it does not mean that the powers of the executive... The, what we are suggesting is that there be a more balanced executive. Mm -hmm. That an executive who, who is, which is accountable to parliament. So if you take the president, the, uh, the prime minister and the cabinet of ministers, uh, they would have adequate powers to ensure that uh, the constitution is safeguarded. Mm -hmm. the, all the provisions of the constitution is safeguarded. The there, there is no allegation that the 19th Amendment affected the unitary status of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. that, uh, so that is a, once again, that is, that is a fallacy. So you need to, what, what is, the, the, the executive presidency in Sri Lanka has failed.
<laughs> you have every time uh, since President Jayawardena, we we r people who do remember would remember that his second term was uh, w w in the country there was there was the country have faced very many problems and some of these problems which the, we, the, even the war and some of the problems arose from the uh, the manner in which executive powers were exercised. The, 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 then thereafter you had President Premadasa, then President Vijay Tunga, the, uh, President Kumar Tunga, when she came into power, promised to abolish the executive presidency. There was in fact a mid a constitutional amendment brought in mm -hmm. to uh, abolish the executive presidency, but it was cut. So pre in many, many presidents have come in promising to abolish the executive presidency, but they have failed to do so. Mm -hmm. So e the, the, I say the, the 40 years, or from 1978 onwards, it, it, 44 years of governance under the executive presidency demonstrates the weaknesses, the failures of the executive presidency. Mm -hmm. And it is a fallacy to say that the country needs to be led by an executive president. The, an executive pre, uh, the, uh, and the, you can have a strong government with a prime minister and a cabinet of ministers. But the only difference there is you have a prime minister and cabinet of ministers who are responsible to parliament and also to the people. Mm -hmm. The present executive presidency makes it virtually impossible to remove the president from office. Uh, I, if we can go into the provisions of impeachment, we, I will give you an example. We'll take a quick uh, break before we speak more. We're in conversation with President's Council, Salia Pires, the president of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Welcome back. Um, Mr. Pierce, uh, among your proposals, you say abolition of the executive presidency as early as possible, but no later than 15 months, the executive presidency to be replaced by a parliamentary form of government. But why no uh, later than 15 months? Where, what kind of challenges do we face uh, constitutionally? No, well, uh, why we suggested no later than, uh, there will be uh, legislation which needs to be enacted. Mm -hmm. And uh, one would have to, in order to ensure that there is a parliamentary executive. And what we do suggest is that we, at the moment there is a president who has been elected after after a gen, after a presidential election. So have have the necessary legislation prepared. Take six, uh, take at okay. least uh, a maximum of six months. But we say if you can do it earlier, do so. And then uh, ha agree on a time frame to. Re uh, repeal the uh, the executive presidency to abolish the executive presidency. Mm -hmm. We uh, we think it should be done as early as possible, but we do recognize there are maybe practical difficulties in uh, doing it uh, forthwith. Mm -hmm. So there were to be, you take a, take time, look at the provisions which need to be enacted, uh, and proceed with it. Uh, we see that regardless of uh, people going out to the streets uh, demonstrating and protesting against the government, asking the president and prime minister to step down, uh, step down asking uh, the government to remove themselves from office, uh, and the opposition too, we do not see any meaningful efforts taken going forward. Now, the opposition proposed a no-confidence motion being labeled as a damp squib uh, in that it will end up being a, a mere symbolic expression of displeasure and um, that it has no real means to remove the president according to the constitution and that impeachment remains uh, the only means to remove the president. If you may explain to us what this is, why a no-confidence wouldn't work and why are we still uh, pushing for a no-confidence motion if uh, the impeachment is the only well, way and on what grounds? Yes, there is, well, the, uh, the, the way of removing the president from office is under Article 38 of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now there are specific provisions by which the president can be impeached or removed from office. Right. And that is, that is, that is Article 38 of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Now the Pre the way the presidency falls vacant is set out also in that same article. Mm -hmm. So there are various ways which a vacancy can arise, but here the relevant relevant provisions would be by resignation mm -hmm. or by impeachment. Mm -hmm. Now, if the of course, if a president any time resigns, then there is a uh, uh, that's a way forward. But if a president does not resign, 
he has to be impeached mm -hmm. if he's to be removed from office right now those who bring a, who are who are proposing a vote of no confidence on the president take the position that in terms of article 42 of the constitution the president is responsible and answerable to parliament mm. so th uh, this is why i say the executive uh, presidency is flawed because we have the the constitution say the president is responsible and answerable to parliament mm -hmm. but the manner in which he is responsible and answerable is not specific apart from the impeachment provisions now the, there is a there is a school of thought to say that because of article 42 of the constitution because the president is responsible and answerable to parliament a vote of no confidence can brought be brought in respect of his performance mm -hmm. now that would not have the if that is passed that would not have the effect of removing him from office mm -hmm. that would not have the effect of removing him from office on on what grounds can the president be removed can uh, the mismanagement of the economy or the current economic crisis constitute uh, f to to uh, impeach the president yes in fact the the, the constitution does not specify mm -hmm. uh, the mismanagement of the economy it's per se as a ground to uh, to imp to remove the president from office but this is what I, I i will read out from article 38 of the constitution mm -hmm. uh, these are the grounds on which the president can be uh, can be removed from office mm -hmm. I, I, i will take the constitutional provision itself for uh, for the benefit of everybody mm -hmm. uh, well the uh, it, it says any member of parliament can by writing can by uh, writing address to the speaker give notice of a resolution alleging so these are the grounds that the president is permanently incapable of discharging the functions of his office mm -hmm. by reason of mental or physical infirmity so if because of physical infirmity or mental infirmity he is permanently incapable of holding office then that itself is a ground for removal mm -hmm. apart from that that he is found guilty of intentional violation of the constitution mm -hmm. of treason of bribery of misconduct or corruption involving the abuse of powers of his office any offense under any law involving moral turpitude so these are the grounds to remove the president mm -hmm. so mismanagement of the economy is not per se a ground but it could well come within either intentional violation of the constitution or misconduct involving the abuse of powers of his office mm -hmm. it uh, it could come uh, within uh, perhaps be uh, argued that it come those could come within uh, within these sections mm -hmm. but as i told you the process is so complicated that it is virtually impossible to impeach the president so does that mean we will not see a solution to the current crisis the political crisis at least in the near future as, as, as we see it as the bar association sees it we see there is economic and political crisis and we have suggested that it, there must be a way out mm -hmm. because we must understand that the crisis is not necessarily reflected in parliament so you might have a you might have a parliamentary majority the government might have a parliamentary majority mm -hmm. the government Uh, might be able to technically to pass legislation mm -hmm. but the problem is there is a crisis on the ground a cr deep crisis of confidence mm -hmm. in the institutions of this country crisis of confidence in the president crisis of confidence in parliament and that is that is that may not be seen in parliament not be reflected in parliament but that is the ground reality and that is what poses a serious threat to political stability and the economic stability of the country mm -hmm. and the sooner the politicians understand this the better it is for the country what do you suggest uh, as the first step uh, as we at least try to uh, look at these proposals proposed uh, and uh, put forward by the bar association of sri lanka where do they start because it seems that uh, parliament hasn't taken this seriously and we we're not uh, hearing of any new measures taken by government to solve uh, the political crisis and the the i i we or well, what we suggest is what we think is first you have to enact the 19th amendment reenact the 19th amendment now what we call 19 19 plus mm -hmm. then go in for a government of national unity 
we, we suggest that there be a cabinet of ministers of 15 members who are representative of all the parties in parliament. Mm -hmm. Of course, there, are, there would be challenges to that, there would be difficulties, but we do suggest that you draw a cabinet. We think that uh, this is the time the politicians should be united to resolve because the country is facing a very severe economic crisis and in order to resolve that you need everyone to get together. The government of national unity. We suggest that the prime minister must be a person who, who is able to create a consensus among the political parties in parliament. Uh, we, uh, so a, a prime minister who can, who, we hear the question is not the prime minister who can technically be appointed as prime minister. Mm -hmm. who commands the confidence of a majority of members. But we say we have a prime minister where you who, who can actually create a consensus in parliament. Mm -hmm. And so that that will reflect the ground that it, which will reflect the ground realities. Then we suggest that there must be a 15 member cabinet and that there be an advisory committee who will advise the government on policy that key policy decisions should go through the advisory committee, mm -hmm. a committee of experts, uh, because we do not see the possibility of experts coming in on the national list that, that is really not, uh, we don't see that as feasible, but have an advisory committee which would advise and guide the government on uh, policy. We suggest a common minimum program, arrive at a common minimum program, mm -hmm. uh, where which for a period of 18 months, where you can try to re uh, uh, agree on economic measures, uh, debt restructuring, anti-corruption, uh, and so on and so forth, we okay. have suggested. And then the next step would be, we suggest that government go up to a maximum period of 18 months, thereafter go in for a general election. In the meantime, abolish the executive presidency. We've seen protests uh, at the golf face and around the country, and uh, there have been uh, minimal violence but at the same time we see uh, a lot of issues uh, legal issues emanating as a result what is the view of the bar association in situations as these and your personal view to how um, there are two sides to this too we see that uh, the general public is inconvenienced at times and there are at times when uh, when when these protests are necessary to uh, to obviously uh, put pressure on the government amidst shortages of fuel to necessities and uh, power cuts. But how do we manage this in an effective way? Well, I think first of all, protests have to be peaceful and non-violent. And because violence, you play into the hands of those who do not want dissent. It is in the interest of those who do not want dissent to promote, uh, to encourage violence to encourage the protests to be violent because then they can always uh, t tell the public, well, these protests are violent the, and so on. So I think uh, protests have to be peaceful. They have to be non-violent. Mm -hmm. And I think people must learn from the non-violent movements in other countries also. The, the, the non-violent movement of Martin Luther King, of Mahatma Gandhi, where you can, uh, there, there are other examples. So for instance, 1985 or 86 in the Philippines, uh, after the Filipino general, uh, presidential election, where the election commission, uh, the official election commission declared Ferdinand Marcos as elected, but obviously the election was rigged. And there was a massive outflow, uh, pouring out of people's power, and which uh, toppled the Marcos regime. So you have example of non-violent uh, non protests. We should not encourage violence at all. That is, that is the bottom line. We say that peaceful protests, peaceful expression of dissent must be encouraged. In fact, it is good for any party in power to hear an opposing view. Very often what happens with the executive, very often with the executive presidency especially, but when you are in power, those around you don't want to tell you the truth. They keep you in a little uh, cocoon and you are told everything which you like to hear. But that is not the truth. So by the time you realize the truth, it is too late. Mm -hmm. So that is what happens when, when people are in positions of power. So that is why dissent is very important. 
the right to disagree. It must be encouraged. It must be encouraged and uh, politicians should not uh, be averse to dissent. Everyone, all of us must be, we, we should accept criticism. There will be people criticizing us. People uh, saying various things uh, about us on social media, so on. Uh, not only politicians, professionals. Everyone must, 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 be, must accept uh, disagreement. Disagreement is a good thing. Uh, that is how, that is the way forward in constructive a democracy. Criticism. Constructive criticism. And that is the way forward in, in, mm. in dissent. And that is why Justice Mark Fernando in the Janagosha case, the Janagosha case, he says this. He, 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 he encourages dissent. Interestingly, it was a 1992, a U, it was a UNP government in power. Mm -hmm. uh, the SLFP organized the Janagosha. Mm. Uh, noisy protests mm. on a particular day. I think it was not in this scale of protests we are seeing now. But then the police went and arrested people. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the Justice Fernando says, he says, he says, IGP must direct, must instruct his people uh, that uh, these peaceful protests must not be interfered with. Mm -hmm. And that is, I, what I, our position is peaceful protests, protesters must be allowed. What is, uh, what is the role of law enforcement authorities, the police and the military in, in a scenario? Is I, I think that, that is very clearly set out in the law. If mm. you look at section 95, 96, 97 of the Criminal Procedure Code, it sets out at what point the uh, law enforcement comes in. Mm. If an assembly turns out to be unlawful, there are provisions to disperse the assembly. But first, uh, and in fact, in 2016, on the advice of the Attorney General, the, the IGP issued a circular mm. on how to deal with protests and there is a protocol which is prepared. So that uh, then, uh, so the use of lethal force is a very last resort and uh, so you, and it is necessary for the police, the armed forces to understand, and the guy, especially the government, to understand why people are protesting. We did see an unfortunate uh, incident in Rabukkana and then we, s we see uh, certain uh, other pockets of uh, violence at certain areas. But again, uh, you've uh, brought new light to the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Uh, you were uh, appointed uncontested as the president uh, for this 2022 side. and 2023. But uh, 2021, you won a majority there, giving hope that Sri Lanka's judiciary will be independent. Uh, how, how do you look at Sri Lanka as uh, an independent judiciary in Sri Lanka? For a long time there have been allegations and uh, th th there haven't been much faith in how um, a lot of matters were handled. Well, I, I, to be fair, I think it also depends on the facts and circumstances of each case. Uh, if you, there have been instances where we have had reason to be proud of our judiciary. I think one of the key points was the 2018 dissolution case. The manner in which our Supreme Court handled the dissolution case uh, from the point to leave, leave to proceed was granted to the point on which uh, the judgment was given. I think it was an absolute moment of pride for, for our judiciary. We have the, the Sri Lanka judiciary has uh, had its high moments. Of course, we also must uh, we know that there have been there has been criticism. So we need, a, I think, an in, for a, there to be an independent judiciary. I, I do believe that the, the, the independence of the judiciary is very necessary for the life of this nation. For there to be an independent judiciary, there must be an independent bar. And the, uh, because the, the bar, bench and the bar, the relationship between the bench and bar is very important. And the bar needs to pay attention to the independence of the judiciary. We must respect the judiciary. We must ensure that the executive does not interfere with the judiciary. Uh, the tw 20th Amendment was uh, inimical to the independence of the judiciary. But we must also, we also know that the, 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 the 20th Amendment is not, not something new. Where from the inception of the 78th Constitution, there have been instances where there have been appointments, questionable appointments done by various executive presidents. And uh, though some have been challenged, some, for technical reasons, those challenges have been thrown out. Ultimately, as just Chief Justice Neville Samarkon had said, it is for each individual judge to act independently. And he, he, he has so, so say, said that he said, if, you, if, a, if a judge were to bend his spine 
not you can't make uh, no one else can uh, make that straight uh, so so that is so ultimately it is up to each individual judge to act according to the light of his conscience and to be independent of course we must also say, remember that not it is not necessarily what is popular what is right so just because the public demand various things judges have to act according to evidence according to proof and that sometimes we know that sometimes public opinion might not necessarily be what is justice or what is reflected mm -hmm. but that the public also have to understand that courts have to act on evidence have to act on procedures and merely not merely what is popular in the eyes of the public so that is so, so it is necessary that the public also respects the independence of the judiciary and respects that judges the, uh, the, the judges sometimes have to take decisions which might not necessarily be popular uh, we're talking about large-scale corruption among politicians here, um, most of which are not either documented or not investigated and not proven. Yet uh, there is talk, there is there are allegations. So what are the legal constitutional grounds to investigate these politicians? Well, I think we, our laws on corruption are relatively weak. Mm -hmm. uh, we, ha we, have a we, have, we don't have a separate law on corruption. We have the Bribery Act. Then one section, Section 70 on corruption. We have a Bribery Commission. 1994 Act meant it to be independent. The uh, 19th Amendment strengthened that. The 20th Amendment has reversed it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the independence of the appointments at least, uh, the manner of appointments. So we have, we need to ensure that there is public confidence in institutions. And that is why we say that the 19th Amendment is important because it created or started to create a climate of confidence mm -hmm. in, in institutions. And I think for institutions to be independent, that we also, publi the public have to be confident. Mm -hmm. So relating to the corruption regime, I think there are new laws which can be brought in on proceeds of crime, strengthening the Assets and Liabilities Act. In fact, Transparency International has suggested that uh, there must be greater transparency in uh, uh, the Assets and Liabilities mm -hmm. Law, so that the public can have access to know who and uh, what their assets they have declared are. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, you need a comprehensive anti-corruption law. There are draft laws which, in fact, had been prepared uh, at the Bribery Commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, those might have to be enacted. But of course, I think the commission, the, uh, the office of the Bribery Commission also has to be strengthened in that very often we have as investigators police officers. But I think to have an effective uh, probe into bribery and corruption, you might need to have other expertise, accountants, auditors, engineers, uh, those who are able to do forensic audits, uh, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I think that is that uh, th that is why I, we say that uh, those have to be strengthened. But also some of these are long-term measures. You are not going to get overnight uh, to d to deal with all the problems. Does that but for that, you have to strengthen the institutions. Does that mean we will have to bring in new provisions to investigate the past actions of these politicians, the mass crimes of financial crimes that we're talking about? I, I think the laws need to be, institutions need to be strengthened, the laws need to be strengthened. The, there is uh, the allegation of delays, but also we have to understand that ultimately courts have to also act on evidence, not on what you read on WhatsApp and on Facebook and so on. Mm -hmm. There has to be hard evidence which is brought in. Okay. And that is, a, that is a challenge not only in Sri Lanka, but in all other countries, it is a challenge uh, to bring, to find the monies uh, which, have been, uh, we, we, which have been siphoned off, uh, stolen. Uh, and many, I, I'm sure those who are engaged in corruption are also experts at that. And they know how to, uh, how to hide uh, their trail, so to say. So, so th for that, you you need. But I believe my my view that you, you, you how you do that is by creating independent and strong institutions, but also a vigilant public, public which is aware of their rights, but also I think a public which is aware of their responsibilities also. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps we must create a culture in our country where we discourage bribery. But when we talk of bribery and corruption. It is not only the politicians to be, uh, it is also at the level of officials also there is corruption. And there is also the, 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 the uh, private citizens 
the private sector, who might also be encouraging corruption at different levels. When you talk of tenders, uh, uh, who bids for those tenders? It is the private sector. You know, who deals with the uh, stock market? Uh, who engages in uh, in uh, 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 in insider dealing? It is probably it is uh, those in the private sector. So I think if you are when we talk of corruption, certainly politicians, but politicians are not the only source, and that is something. And I think this is a this is work in progress. Mm -hmm. You are not going to have things happening overnight, right. but you have to be a start building those institutions. We'll take a short break here at Hyde Park to stay with us. Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park and we're in conversation with President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, Mr. Salia Pires. Uh, what would be the role of the Bar uh, in the future? How do you envisage the Bar in future well, I, Sri I, Lanka? I think a strong and an independent Bar is needed for our profession mm -hmm. and it is needed for, this, for the country. Because I, as I said earlier, an independent Bar helps an uh, independent judiciary. An independent bar is also committed to preserving the rule of law, the uh, human rights, the fundamental human rights of people. And I think that the bar, we need a strong bar, an independent bar. Of course, the bar, the bar also has to look at the interests of its members. It is a professional association, and the interests and uh, professional development of its members also play a very important role. And especially, we have a large number of uh, members, young members, uh, safeguarding their interests is also part of, of uh, uh, the role of the bar and to ensure that we have a skilled train we have skilled trained lawyers who are able to serve the public uh, you spoke of fundamental rights uh, uh, we can, I'd like to come back to the present situation in the country, a fundamental right to have access to necessities. And uh, government, the president, they failed to uh, provide people with their basic necessities. So isn't this grounds to take action uh, against parliament? But, but what constitutional grounds do we have here? Well, uh, the, B, the Bar Association has, uh, in fact, filed, uh, we filed a fundamental rights uh, mm -hmm. application, which is supported by... Uh, a, a, a team of lawyers mm -hmm. uh, and uh, two applications are filed where we, we have brought, the, we have highlighted the economic uh, crisis in the country and the Supreme Court has granted leave to proceed and uh, we have sought orders that, to, that the state be directed to keep the court uh, informed of the steps it is going to take and how measures it is going to take mm -hmm. to, uh, to ease the problems of the people. Mm -hmm. In fact, we as far back as January the Bar Association warned of the impending uh, economic crisis. At that time, no one was willing to speak in public of this. Mm -hmm. uh, no major association, institution was, able, was willing to talk of this in, pub, in public. So we took, uh, took it and we said, this is a, there's a looming economic crisis which is going to impact on the rights of people, on the rule of law. And of course, I'm not, we are not happy that what we said has become true. But, but the bar has been we, proactive. Uh, we We've have seen been a proactive lot of on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, fundamental rights, uh, of course, most many of these rights relate to the basic essentials people need. And of course, some of it is found in more in the directive principles of state policy. Uh, in, in Sri Lanka, the right to life uh, per se is rather restricted in terms of the constitution. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, we, we have filed a fundamental rights application and we have obtained leave to proceed. So we let's see how that progresses. Uh, a future constitution, a new constitution for Sri Lanka, what do you see as the salient features that a new constitution should have? Well, because we've talk, we, we're now talking about a 21st amendment to the present constitution, but how do we avoid all the present and the past issues and uh, obstructions that yeah. we faced? So I think one, one of the weaknesses of the 78th constitution was that it was tailor-made. Mm -hmm. And very often, if you look at the of the so many amendments, uh, we say 20th, 20th, 20th amendment, but in fact, there were 19. One amendment did not pass. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, we have, uh, of these amendments, the I think many of them were to address a particular issue or to address a particular political need mm -hmm. of a particular president. 
if you, you can take the, th uh, the some of the amendments which brought to the referendum, the uh, uh, amendment which uh, allowed the president to contest early elections, the 18th amendment, the 20th amendment, all these introduced to for a particular president or for a particular uh, purpose. I think a constitution must be an enduring document. Uh, the American constitution is two, over 200 years, uh, almost 250 years, amended 37 times. Sri Lanka, we have a constitution since 78, already amended, uh, we are in the 20th, and we are talking about 21st. So any new constitution must be an enduring document. Mm -hmm. But a constitution must be also prepared by the people of the country. When I say prepared by the people, it may be drafted by uh, professionals, but it must reflect the values of the people. And for instance, in the South African constitution, when it was drafted, mm -hmm. there was a lot of input from the people. So I, for one, I do not subscribe to only lawyers getting together and making a constitution. I don't think that is the way forward. I think the way forward is an, uh, for, a, for it to be an enduring document, mm -hmm. you have must ha it must reflect the values of the people of a country. And that constitution making is not an easy task. It, 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 would, take, it would take time. Uh, there are different schools of thought, different, uh, we are, so I, 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 at this stage, I, it would not be my, uh, I don't think I should say this ought to be the constitution, mm -hmm. but I think any constitution must look at safeguarding the fundamental rights of people, enhancing the present fu fundamental rights regime. Mm -hmm. I would like a new constitution to include the right to life and the right to live in human dignity as a provision, mm -hmm. so that then the, uh, the courts can flesh out uh, these uh, provisions and uh, and to uh, to expand the fundamental rights of people. Mm -hmm. I would like a constitution where there are checks and balances, and where there is a, the independence of the judiciary is guaranteed, and where the uh, where the judiciary is able to even review to review l uh, legislation enacted by parliament. What now we do not have in our uh, in presently we do not have post. Uh, enactment review of legislation. Once parliament passes a law, that is that. It is only at the bill stage the court can examine it. But I would think a, a new constitution should be, should be we should have po post enactment judicial review of legislation, uh, and that would contribute to enhancing to protecting the rights of of the people of this country. What is your view on some of uh, the provisions that led to? Uh, several crises in the country, uh, be it concerning uh, different communities, people of different faith, language, and also uh, as we look at a united country where all communities can uh, live in peace. That is, I, th I think, that, that is why I say when you enact a constitution, it has to be a consultative process. It has to be a consultative process. So I don't think there is, it is, there is one recipe. Mm -hmm. We cannot say, well, this is the recipe and this is what should be. It must be something which comes out, comes from the people, mm -hmm. which comes from the people, and where people of different uh, views, of different uh, communities, of different religions, can sit down together and thrash out. Mm -hmm. And I think we must encourage that we might not be able to agree on everything. Uh, we have to agree to disagree. And also, I think, also people of everyone must also learn to compromise. Of course, there will be certain, there will be certain, uh, the ultimately we, what we want is a, a united country where the people of this country progress. And uh, I think it is, uh, the, it is the, the people have to contribute to the constitutional making. Mm -hmm. It must be not, uh, which is top down. Right. Uh, very, very often we find the constitution, the 78th constitution was enacted for the, it was, uh, well, the, the, the government of the day thought this is what should be done and it was imposed. But I think uh, a better way would be to have a more, to, to, to have a greater consultation process and then ultimately in a, find a way of enacting a constitution which is, which can, which would be enduring mm -hmm. and for which would, uh, year, decades or hundred years down the line uh, where we can have a constitution which we are proud of. Without so many amendments in such a short span of time. I, I don't think the 78th constitution is a constitution we can particularly be proud of. 
um, very quickly to talk about the current uh, economic uh, issues and other uh, uh, crises that are emanating as a result of this economic issue. Tourism to uh, investment. Uh, my question is whether there are, in, while we talk about an impeachment to no confidence motion and the bar speaks of a national unity government and there's uh, agreement of a cons uh, consensus government, but in the interim, what do we do about fast-tracking investment, uh, legal, what legal measures can we take yeah, so we uh, have to encourage tourism, to uh, other investment in the, into yeah. the country? So, so, of course, encouraging tourism, I think you need political stability. And if you are going to have a country with power cuts and um, uh, transport stoppages uh, and people who are unhappy, you are not going to encourage tourism. So that is the ground reality. You might have a majority in parliament, but in with the, yeah, the on the ground is their stability and that is very important o on the economic side i the e we have suggested as a, a part of the common minimum program the ease of doing business mm -hmm. i think we need we need to ensure that there is ease of doing business uh, that part people who want to invest not only uh, uh, people from outside people from within the country who want to invest that things are easier for them to do business we know that if you if you have to get 15 uh, or half a dozen approvals uh, from different uh, uh, places, people are going to get fed up. And that is, I think that is one bottleneck we have to, uh, where people have, are driven from pillar to post uh, for, the, for the things. We know even if you want to build a house, you have to get dozens of approvals. If you, you have to fill so many forms. Uh, for, for various things, I, I think we, our, uh, the government, when I say government, it's not only the present government, but over a period of time, uh, we have become very bureaucratic. We require forms to be filled, forms to be filled in triplicate. Uh, when, 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 for instance, you, uh, f just to give you a very simple example, if you need to get a certified copy from a court registry, you cannot collect it on the day you pay the money. You have to first pay the money, then it will be issued only on the next day. Mm -hmm. And there is no logical reason. Then sometimes when you go to file a case, if it is 3-1, the counter is closed. Because m f cash is accepted only till 3. Someone comes in at 3-1, they are turned but away. How can we change all this? So I, I think we need to have a more efficient structure. Of course, part of it is also, I think, to have more digitization mm -hmm. of all our systems. Uh, and I do not know whether <laughs> in this day when we are struggling for the basics like gas and fuel, whether we can talk of digitization anymore. But I think the way ahead is, is to make things easier for people. I think a lot of red tape and red tape bureaucracy leads to corruption. Mm -hmm. You make give people more opportunities to make money illegally. So that is something you have to uh, address and that, that, that is also very, very important. I think the less red tape, the less bureaucratic uh, uh, obstacles are there, uh, there will be less corruption. Uh, you spoke about exemplary uh, members of the judiciary um, who have led in, who had worked independently. And we've also seen uh, members of the lead, le uh, legal fraternity who have been independent. Uh, but as I spoke about your um, appointment as the president of the Bar Association, we, we did see that regardless of political affiliation, uh, you had a majority vote and then you were uh, appointed uncontested. But ha haven't you had uh, much pressure politically? Well, I must say that I, I have not had any political, <laughs> no pressure politically uh, from uh, either side. And I think uh, we have the Bar seeks to be independent and not political. And uh, so decisions we take, are collective, collective decisions of the executive committee of the Bar Council, and we, we are not political. So, if you take the set of proposals which we have proposed, we have not carried political slogans. Uh, we, we are there to look after, look at the interests of the country, look at the interests of the Bar, and we need to, we, we do not need to get involved in partisan politics. Uh, and that, that I think is the way to go. And I must say that the members of the bar, the members of the bar, also the junior members of our profession have been an example in this present uh, time and I am proud to be able to have been uh, given the opportunity of leading the bar at this time, but it is a collective contribution of our members 
who have thought it fit that we must stand up for the rights of the people of this country. Thank you very much for your time here at Hyde Park. Uh, we value your expertise and your thoughts. Thank you. We had with us uh, President's Council, Salia Pires, the President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, previously the first Chairman of the Office of Missing Persons, Member of Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka, and um, also a Deputy President for the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Thank you for joining us as we discussed uh, the Constitution and the political crisis in Sri Lanka. We'll see you again next week with yet another episode. Have a pleasant evening. Good night. <laughs>